most importantly, Burroughs is introduced to the technique of free association and the exploration of the riches of the unconscious. I argue that he develops his own techniques that result from free association and the unconscious, in particular, his literary technique of mosaic construction. Burroughs in mental distress. The symptoms that drove Burroughs into therapy include the following. One, he felt disembodied. In an interview with Charles Ruas, Burroughs admits that he felt, quote, divorced from his body from the age of 17 to 23 as a result of his suppression of his homosexuality. Two, Miggy, who later married, Burroughs's brother Maud remembers him in childhood as, quote, withdrawn, unable to make friends, living in a dream world. Burroughs also felt alienated from his peer group at school and university. It was only when he became an addict that he achieved the identity of an outlaw about which he'd fantasized since reading Jack Black's You Can't Win. Three. Burroughs, Bur sorry, Burroughs formed an hysterical attachment to his nanny, Mar Mary Evans, such that he could, quote, hear the dark mutterings of a servant underworld. When he was four, Mary took him out to the countryside with her boyfriend, where something unspeakable happened, probably of a sexual nature. Four, Burroughs suffered from bad parenting, at the very least because his mother and father could not respond in an adequate way to attempts by their son to communicate the emotional upheaval caused by such events as the abuse by Mary and her boyfriend. Freud and his couch. Burroughs's analyses. Burroughs studied the theories of Freud and underwent analysis in New York in the late 1930s and early 1940s after various personal tragedies. His first analysis was with Dr. Herbert Wiggers, a committed and traditional Freudian. Burroughs' mental health issues culminated in his chopping off the tip of his little finger after a row with his first boyfriend, Jack Anderson. Dr. Wiggers, replaced, sorry, Dr. Wiggers placed Burroughs in Bellevue Hospital from where he transferred to Payne Whitney Hospital. He was diagnosed as suffering from dementia precox, catatonic type. In layman's terms, Dr. Wiggers diagnosed Burroughs as rendering himself vulnerable to contempt and betrayal by those he loved. And Dr. Wiggers maintained that these feelings led Burroughs to self-harm and might in the future lead him to attempt suicide. As it turned out, it led him to heroin. Second analysis, Dr. Paul Fadern. Burroughs entered a second phase of analysis after the murder of David Camera by Lucien Carr, two of Bill's peer group. Dr. Ferdern had been vice president of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society before moving to New York. He possessed, quote, patricidal eyes and argued against one major tenet of traditional Freudianism. He maintained that it was a lack rather than a surplus of narcissistic libido that caused poor mental health. He also had a belief in telepathy between patients and himself, recording 1,300 instances. From Dr. Fadern, Burroughs may well have adapted the idea of telepathy between therapist and therapist to telepathy between people in general, and the reverse direction of mind reading in the prof in campus of Interzone University in Naked Lunch. Dr. Faden's policy was to build up, rather than break down, a patient's defensive mechanisms. 
Nevertheless, Fedel attempted to have Burroughs disclose the nature of the incident with Mary Evans and her boyfriend that so troubled his patient. Burroughs was unable to elucidate the event and became disenchanted with Fedel's therapeutic technique. Truth Jug. Third analysis, Dr. Lewis Volberg. Burroughs transferred to the practice of Dr. Lewis Volberg, who was a hyp hypnoanalyst specializing in restoring hidden memories. Dr. Volberg administered sodium pentothal to a patient who would then reveal his secrets. For Burroughs, the treatment released various alter egos stored in his unconscious including a southern gentleman, an English aristocrat, and a black man. He talked in strange accents and mimicked various people. As a cure, the treatment was a failure and Burroughs gave up analysis. As part of his artistic development, the treatment may have encouraged his faith in his performance and literary use of the routine a pastime that he enjoyed with his friends. The importance of Freudianism to Burroughs as a writer. The importance of Burroughs' therapeutic and theoretical knowledge of Freudianism is multifarious. Firstly, Burroughs makes explicit use of Freudian concepts such as the superego, the id, and so on in his writing. For example, in the appendix to the soft machine. Secondly, many of the other concepts that Burroughs uses are traceable to Freudian concerns. For example, control, homosexuality and repression. Thirdly, much of Burroughs' writing lends itself to a Freudian interpretation. Fourthly, he uses literary techniques that are influenced by Freudian theory. Automatic writing, cut-ups, and the use of dream material are all techniques related to free association, whereby the conscious part of the mind is bypassed and the unconscious is trawled directly. Burroughs' repetition technique, which is employed in Naked Lunch and Soft Machine, can also be regarded in this light. In general, Burroughs leans towards the radical and the execrable, which suggests that he is able to pick through the garbage from his id for diamonds in a way that the non-therapand cannot. For the remainder of this presentation, I shall focus on the most innovat innovative literary technique of Burroughs that I believe is influenced by Freudianism. Mosaic construction theory. According to Burroughs, there is mosaic construction at the level of meaning and at the level of ordering text. One, the word cannot be expressed direct. It can perhaps be indicated by mosaic of juxtaposition, like articles abandoned in a hotel drawer defined by negatives and absence. Two, selection of chapters, in this case in Naked Lunch, form a sort of mosaic with the cryptic significance of juxtaposition, like objects abandoned in a hotel drawer, a form of still life. Mosaic construction, example. An important image employed in both quotations is that of things abandoned in a hotel drawer. They are there because the owner or owners needed them at some point, but they've chucked them into a drawer and forgotten about them and left them there when they quit the hotel. Perhaps it's a reference to the Beat Hotel where any of the guests could add anything they liked to the word bank that Burroughs stored in his head and on paper. At some point, Burroughs would open the drawer and take a look at what was inside. Or maybe it's an image of the unconscious 
where forgotten items like the details of the Mary Evans incident are retained until that particular drawer is opened. Objects abandoned in a hotel drawer. In his book, Mosaic of Juxtaposition, Michael Bolton expounds the procedural claim, which was my number two, as a method for, quote, developing narrative by creating networks of images, characters, themes, and events that are not causally related, but connect through their associations and juxtapositions. Bolton holds that the concept of mosaic construction finds post hoc validity in an argument of Deleuze and Guattari, which states that, quote, every sign refers to another sign and only to another sign ad infinitum. Therefore, all signs are signs of signs. Bolton's methodological claim appears seductive in the light of the structure or anti-structure of naked lunch, but falters since it depends on the term narrative being fixed. A narrative is the very phenomena that naked lunch undermines. Another problem arises because Bolton commits a category error. The Deleuze and Guattari argument relates to the meaning of language in terms of the single sign. Bolton takes their argument as against the ordering of pieces of text, which is a different matter. Bolton would have done better to use the Deleuze and Guattari argument with regard to Burroughs' theory of meaning. Furthermore, Bolton commits the logical error of circularity when he explains what Mark Burroughs means by juxtaposition by using the same term, namely juxtaposition to elucidate it. No illumination follows. He needs to define the term juxtaposition in this context, which he fails to do. However, Bolton is insightful in drawing attention to a unique creative strategy and in seeing the anti-structure of Naked Lunch as a serious challenge to the essential role of the plot in the novel as traditionally understood. Although Bolton does not make this point explicitly, it's worth, it's worth noting the resultant contradiction between the absence of causality between events in mosaic construction and causality between events in the traditional novel as espoused by Ian e. Forster, the champion of fiction writing orthodoxy. Ian e. Forster, Aspects of the Novel. Forster writes in Aspects of the Novel, quote, a story is a narrative of events arranged in their time sequence. A plot is also a narrative of events, the emphasis falling on causality. The king died and then the queen died is a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief is a plot. The time sequence is preserved, but the sense of causality overshadows it. Since Bolton describes the narrative of Naked Lunch as comprising, quote, networks of events not causally related, he would read Burroughs as, as subverting Forster's view. In addition, Bolton emphasizes the responsibility of the reader of Naked Lunch, quote, to make connections and establish patterns where the reader is a partner with the author in the creation of narrative meaning. Using a pair of terms beloved by Burroughs, a text requires cooperation between the sender and the receiver. The experience of reading Naked Lunch. The concept of mosaic construction can be developed further when it's understood that Burroughs reinvents the reading process as well as requiring an alternative basis of interpretation. In William Burroughs and the Secret of Fascination, 
Oliver Harris argues for an experiential thesis concerning the unique nature of the act of reading Naked Lunch. This experience involves being overwhelmed by the text, whether the reader finds it repellent, salacious, or delicious. As Burroughs remarks, the reader encounters, quote, a frozen moment when everyone sees what is on the end of every fork. This comment suggests that the reader's engagement with Naked Lunch includes a visual element since the reader sees what is about to stick into his mouth. Given that the contents of the book is a kind of meal, a naked lunch, the overall experience of the text is better thought of as an ingestion of words than as a purely mental exercise which Bolton considers it to be. Employing prandial terminology, the reader swallows what is on the end of every fork. In Freudian terms, the reader interjects the words. The Ancient Mariner. A positive clue for reading Burroughs' intention in psychoanalytic terms is given by the prof in campus of Interzone University where he expounds Coleridge and his poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I suggest that just as Burroughs, if viewed as speaking through the prof, conceptualises the relationship between the ancient mariner, sender, and the wedding guest, receiver, so Burroughs conceptualises the relationship between the narrator of Naked Lunch and the reader. The prof remarks that, quote, the ancient mariner does not stop just anybody, thereby inflicting unsent for boredom and working random hardship. He stops those who cannot choose but hear. Owing to already existing relation between the mariner, however ancient, and the uh, wedding guest. What the, ancient, sorry, what the mariner actually says is not important. He may be rambling, irrelevant, even crude and rampant senile, but something happens to the wedding guest, like happens in psychoanalysis, when it happens, if it happens. The prof, by way of illustration, adduces the case of an analyst who does all the talking in a therapeutic session while the patient listens, taking in not what is said by the analyst, but what is revealed from his unconscious. Quote, nothing can ever be accomplished on the verbal level. The analyst was not reading the mind of the patient, the patient was reading his mind. That is, the patient has ESP awareness of the analyst's dreams and schemes, whereas the analyst contacts the patient strictly from front brain. According to the penultimate quotation, the reader of Naked Lunch is compelled to pour through the text since he, quote, cannot choose but do so. This compulsion is determined by an unconscious mechanism that is triggered when the text is read. Please note that the concepts of compulsion, unconscious mechanism and trigger are Freudian in origin. Moreover, not everybody qualifies for the resultant relationship between narrator and reader. Once underway, the reading experience parallels the reversed form of psychoanalysis outlined in the ultimate quotation, where the verbal level of communication has nugatory value. Instead of the usual linguistic transmission expected of reading, something, quote, happens to the reader akin to projective identification, a process in which the patient experiences the unconscious of the analyst through, quote, awareness of the analyst's dreams and schemes. Burroughs is the analyst and the reader is the patient. Nothing could be more dream and scheme-like than the contents of Naked Lunch. Conclusion. I've outlined Burroughs' education 
in Freudianism, well, very minimally, and the three analyses that he undertook, engendered by his mental health issues that presented during his adolescence and young adulthood. I've alluded to the Freudian, sorry, I've alluded to the Freudian approach with a Barosian spin that can be traced to much of his textual output. This includes the use of Freudian concepts explicitly and implicitly, and the adaptation of the technique of free association to some of his literary techniques. In particular, I've focused on mosaic construction and delineated its direct challenge to traditional novel writing where causation between story events is considered to be fundamental to plot. More work can be done on the other literary techniques of Burroughs that are influenced by Freudianism, and mention might have been made of Burroughs's rejection of Freudianism. However, I do not think that this alters the influence that this school of thought had on him consciously and unconsciously. Thank you.